Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to our Trek uh, discussion tonight. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the uh, important and interesting topic of the prosperity gospel. And uh, tonight, we have uh, Pastor John, along with myself, and uh, Charles Adenogy. And uh, so I'll just pass it over to uh, Pastor John now uh, to kind of introduce and talk through our evening. Well, thanks, Jamie. And uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, who's joining us this evening uh, for this uh, one-hour session on the prosperity gospel. Um, basically, tonight is going to be uh, something of a conversation. There will be a teaching part to it, uh, but uh, for the most part, just a conversation between uh, Jamie and Charles and I. I'm very glad that Charles is here. Uh, Charles and his, his family have been attending our church, I think, for at least a year now, perhaps a little longer than that. And um, I think, Charles, the first time I met you or conversed with you was at uh, the church picnic we had down near the lakefront. Uh, that must be a couple of years ago before, before COVID came. Yes. Yeah. And we had, over two years ago now. Yeah, we had, a very, um, we had a very good conversation at that time, and I was quite intrigued by your, your background. So uh, perhaps you could just uh, introduce yourself uh, to us, tell us... Uh, where you're from, uh, a little bit about your family, what you do for a living. Um, you're not Canadian born, we know. Uh, we can tell from your accent. So uh, just tell us where, where you're from. We'd love to have the people right. good, know, know good, you better. All right, good evening everyone, West Thailand and everyone around the world who's watching this. I'm Charles Adeniji, I'm married to one wife and I'm a father of three. Uh, been a believer since I was uh, 21, uh, 1920, and I've been in Canada for a little over 14 years now. And I've been at West Island for two years and seven months. So uh, it's been a journey and it's been an exciting time. I was originally born from Nigeria and um, it's been, my wife is also from Nigeria. Uh, all our kids, except the first was born here, was born in Nigeria, the first and the two here in Canada. But he came here before he was one. He has no memory of Nigeria. Uh, so to him, he's Canadian, nothing else. But Canada is home for us and we are excited and most importantly, to be part of the West Island family. That's great. Well, thank you for, for being with us tonight. Yeah. And um, we we'll look forward to hearing a little bit more of your story uh, a little bit later uh, this evening. Uh, just so everyone understands, um, our procedure tonight is uh, I'm going to give you a broad overview of the prosperity gospel. Um, I will not mention all of the prosperity gospel preachers by, by name. I'll make reference to some of them. Um, but I just want to give you an overview. It's really impossible in one hour to give you a comprehensive, exhaustive idea of some of the teachings and the theology and the personalities that are part of this a growing movement uh, in our world today. So we just want to give you a, a taste, uh, an overview. So we'll be looking at some broad strokes. Um, I wanna make reference uh, as I start to uh, this book. I'll just kind of hold it up. It might be reversed uh, as you're looking at it, but the, the name of the book is Blessed. And uh, the subtitle is A History of the American Prosperity Gospel. And the author is Kate Bowler, who is a Canadian from Winnipeg. And uh, she is on the faculty of Duke Divinity School in the United States. And uh, she's probably written, uh, I think, the most extensive book outlining the origins, the history, and just how comprehensive this movement is. And so I'm indebted to her for uh, much of the material that I'm sharing with you tonight, as well as some other authors. I won't mention them all, but there are a number of articles that I read. And um, I am, what I'm going to say is, is heavily dependent on them. Uh, I think we should begin with a definition of what the prosperity gospel is. What exactly is this gospel that we call prosperity? And um, there are many def definitions to it, but the prosperity gospel is sometimes, ha has sometimes been referred to as the health and wealth gos gospel. Um, Another um, phrase that is used is the word of faith movement. And um, it really is a perversion uh, of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in essence, it, it claims that um, 
It claims that God rewards increases in faith with increases in health or wealth. So it's all about faith, the word of faith. Uh, we name it by faith. We claim it by faith. And that it's a belief that if we have faith, growing faith, this strong spiritual force that this movement refers to, that we will be free of uh, illness and that we can be financially prosper in, in life. Uh, many years ago, it was, it was referred to as a positive confession theo theo theology, and out of that grew this phrase, the word of faith movement. So Matt, no matter what name we really use to describe it, the essence of its message is, is really the same. Uh, the prosperity gospel teaches that God wants believers to be physically healthy, materially wealthy, and personally happy. An interdenominational group of uh, African um, preachers, teachers, um, functioning under the Lausanne Theology Working Group uh, in Ghana, in Africa, uh, gives this def definition. Uh, these African the the theologians write, we define prosperity gospel as the teaching that believers have the right to blessings of wealth and that they can obtain these blessings through positive confessions of faith and the sowing of seed through the faithful payments of tithes and offerings. And uh, we'll see a little bit later that uh, the whole emphasis on giving tithes and offerings is a major, major teaching, uh, a fixation really uh, among prosperity preachers and in this move movement. So, so where did this actually come, come from? What are the origins of the prosperity go gospel? I made a reference to Kate Bowler and her excellent book, Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel. And she points out that this movement uh, can primarily be traced back to the 19th century in the United States. Uh, in the late, uh, in the 1880s, um, there was a, a movement that uh, arose called the New Thought Movement. And uh, it, it, it emerged in some intellectual and religious settings within the United States. And uh, it centered its basic teaching on essentially three things. And this was a prevalent movement at that time. And the first thing they talked about was a very high view of man. Um, they elevated human potential to the maximum and that human beings in essence could achieve salvation without a person connecting them to God. So a very, very high view of human beings. The movement um, centered its teaching on what today we would call the power of positive thinking. And some of you may remember uh, Norman Vincent Peale back in the 1960s and probably even earlier than that, um, a minister in the United States who wrote this book, The Power of Positive Thinking. He really, really was a latter-day disciple, or at least a mid-20th century disciple of this uh, higher thought movement. Um, there was a Baptist minister uh, in the States. He was an evangelist for a period of time. His name was William Kenyon. Uh, he lived from 1867, the year of uh, Canadian Confederation. And, uh, and died in 1948. And he really is credited with taking this uh, new thought movement thinking that existed in the late 1800s and kind of blending it with evangelical teaching. Um, Kenyon, when he started out, uh, was, was very clearly within the evangelical realm in terms of what he taught. But he developed some views on the atonement and then this influence of the higher thought began to influence him. And as I said, he blended uh, Bible teaching with uh, this, uh, this human philosoph philosophy. So while he grew up in the evangelical mainstream, um, he, he began to develop some views that would have taken him more um, what we might call the left wing of the evangelical movement at that time. And Kenyon claimed that Christ not only secured sanctification or salvation for us in his death on the cross, but his death on the cross also secured for us a, a plethora of other blessings that come from the atonement of Christ. Um, he, he stated that Christians could look to the cross, not as a promise of things to come, 
but as a guarantee of benefits already granted. Now, I, there, there's an element of truth to, to what he believed. Uh, we know that the blessings of the atonement come to us in the here and now. They come to us in the present. But um, his emphasis was the, the things that we know the atonement brings us, eternal life in the future, um, a redeemed body, the new heaven and the new earth, that all of these things, in a sense, could be gained by the believer right now in the present time. Um, he, he went on to talk about Christians having a share in God's creative powers. That, um, and what he meant by that was that, 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 that you and I as believers can acquire the same power that God used when he created the world. And we can use it to attain all that God has promised to us through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And this is where you get this, this positive confession thing that happens, or the word of faith move, move, movement, that when you speak things and you claim things, and you confess certain things, that actually has creative power. And if you listen carefully to some of Joel Olstein's teachings, you can see that there's a, there's a shade of this, an element of this in many of the things that he says. So Kenyon is often referred to by prosperity preachers. And some of the early Pentecostal teachers, um, the, kind of the classic Pentecostalism that emerged in the early 1900s, uh, they saw Kenyon as being an ally uh, because he broadened the scope of the atonement of Christ to go beyond just Christ dying for our sins, that things like healing are uh, included in the atonement of Christ. Now, in saying that, while he was what we would call one of the original members or founders of that, that, that type of classic Pentecostal teaching, uh, he sim I, I, I believe that he moved outside of it in many ways, and that the prosperity gospel has moved well beyond uh, classic Pentecostalism, as we are uh, mostly familiar with it. So what are the primary doctrines then that or teachings of the prosperity gospel. And again, we'll just be able to, to touch on this. Um, this movement is um, very, very diverse. And while for the most part, you see it in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, uh, it is not simply limited to them. There are many who are outside of those circles also, who, who hold to this kind of belief and teaching. And um, so there are a number of different theologies or even denominations that you could classify as a part of this movement. Um, and there would be, for example, within Pentecostalism, you would have Pentecostal churches that would embrace this, but you'd also have Pentecostal churches that reject prosperity gospel teaching. But there seem to be five unifying um, teachings that are characteristic of the movement as a whole. Um, Russell Woodbridge and David Jones have written a book entitled Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Has the Prosperity Gospel Overshadowed the Gospel of Christ? Now, I'm referencing them here because the five key unifying teachings that we seem to see in this move, movement are listed by them in this book that I just mentioned. Five key doctrinal teachings. And, and the first is that the covenant that was given to Abraham is a means to material entitlement for believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, in his book, uh, Spreading the Flame, Edward Poussin writes, Christians are Abraham's spiritual children and heirs to the blessings of faith. This Abrahamic inheritance is unpacked primarily in terms of material entitlement. So we are familiar with the covenant that God made to Abraham. It's there in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis 15. It's repeated again in Genesis chapter 22. And you remember God said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will bring you into the land. I will give you a land and so on. And so there was a material element to the, a, to the promise given to Abraham. But they take this a step fur further. In, in other words, Prosperity Gospel teaches that the primary purpose of the covenant with Abraham was for God to bless Abraham materially, that that was the main part of what he was doing. And so since believers today, uh, you and I are the spiritual children of 
Abraham, as, as we read about that in the, in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, because we're the children of Abraham, we then today inherit um, these financial and material blessings that were promised to Abraham. Um, Kenneth Copeland, uh, who was an older but very well-known prosperity gospel teacher and faith healer, wrote a book in 1974 entitled The Laws of Prosper Prosperity, and he says this. He makes reference to the covenant given to Abraham. He says, since God's covenant has been established and, pros and prosperity is a provision of this covenant, you need to realize that prosperity belongs to you now, not in the future, but now. And he and other prosperity gospel teachers will often make reference to Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, which refers to, I'm quoting it now, the blessings of Abraham have come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus through faith. And so they say, we're the children of Abraham. All these blessings that were promised to Abraham promised us too, the material things. But they only really quote the first part of Galatians 3, verse 14. And this is characteristic of the movement at large, um, taking verses out of context. Because what does Paul say? Well, he says, the blessings of Abraham have come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, and the rest of the verse says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. So Galatians 3.14 is, is, is about the blessing of salvation. It is, it, it's about nothing else. It is not about, it's not referring to receiving physical material wealth. It is talking about the blessing of justification by faith alone and the gift that the Spirit gives us, the gift of the Spirit himself and of eternal life, the, which abides within the Holy Spirit. And so um, uh, when God said to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you, he was referring to Christ and he was refer referring to the salvation that comes through Christ. He really was not talking about material benefits at all. The second thing that, that characterizes the movement and its teaching is that the, the atonement of Jesus extends to the sin of material poverty, and they often refer to material po poverty as a sin. In essence, what they're saying is that both physical healing and um, financial prosperity have been provided uh, for us in the atonement of Christ. Uh, let me quote from Kenneth Cop Cop Copeland again. He, he writes, the basic principle of the Christian life is to know that God has put our sin, sickness, disease, sorrow, grief, and poverty on Jesus at Calvary. Now, classic Pentecostalism teaches that Jesus has taken our sorrows and our diseases, as well as our sin. But Copeland goes a step further and says that Jesus has actually taken our poverty in his death so that we can be rich. So, again, the movement is an aberration of what classic Pentecostal teaching actually says. Now, this error, or, or the, the scope of this error, on the atonement uh, comes from, I think, two other errors that prosperity gospel teachers make. And the first is, um, in reference to Jesus, they, they really have a misunderstanding of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they would agree with us in many ways that he died on the cross for our sins, he rose again from the dead, he did miraculous signs, and taught, and so on. Well, there would be broad agreement there uh, they go so far as to say that, that, that Jesus was not poor, uh, that Jesus was actually wealth, wealthy. John uh, uh, Avanz, Avanzini um, uh, said uh, on, on a number of occasions in the Trinity Broadcasting Net Network in the U.S. that Jesus had a nice house, that Jesus had a big house. 
uh, he said Jesus was always handling big money. Now, he makes reference to Judas Iscariot as being the treasurer of Jesus, and there was all this money, and Judas stole from the, the money bag, so Jesus must have been rich. They were handling big money. How could Jesus have supported these 12 men for three and a half years? He had to have access to all kinds of money, so Jesus was rich and had a big house. Um, uh, Crefro Dollar even has said that Jesus wore designer clothes, uh, in making a reference to the robe that Jesus wore, that it was a seamless robe, uh, really misunderstanding the whole symbolism of the robe that Jesus wore. Um, and I brought that on, out in the series on the tabernacle and the priestly garments uh, in Exodus, that, that really was a sign of Jesus' pre priesthood. So verses like when, where Jesus says, the son of man has no place to lay his head. Now, what does that mean? Well, Jesus did not have a house. Um, Jesus was poor. Now, he wasn't in object poverty to the place where he couldn't provide for his needs. He wasn't so poor that he, he couldn't buy food. But he was among the common people. And while there is evidence that money was handled because Judas was the treasurer. Uh, keep in mind that the woman, who, women who followed Jesus, that many of them, the Gospels point out, were the ones who supported Jesus and the uh, apostles. It was their money that was given to support their ministry, not the money that Jesus had. So they'll even make reference to the gifts that the Magi brought, you know, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There must have been so much gold that it it, it made Jesus a wealthy man. These are the kinds of things uh, you hear these preachers say. Listen, when, when we have a warped view of the life of Jesus, you will end up with a warped view of the death of Jesus. The second error that ties in with this is um, that leads to a faulty view of the atonement is that they misinterpret uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Now, there are many verses, but I, this is one verse that is often refer, referred to, and we refer to it also. You, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, rich in heaven, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, historically, the church has always interpreted that to refer to the spiritual riches that we have in Christ Jesus but they have spun this in a different way. And in a shallow surface reading of that text, it may lead one to believe that Paul was talking about an increase in physical material wealth. But again, when you read 2 Corinthians 8, 9 in its context, it reveals that he was teaching exactly the opposite of what prosperity gospels, gospel preachers say. Paul was teaching that the Corinthians should give their wealth away to needy brothers and sisters in Christ, to those who were poor, and Paul was saying we should help the poor because of what Christ had accomplished uh, for us. It really is a teaching on selflessness. It's not a teaching about getting rich. Now, tied in with this is this whole healing theology piece. Um, and uh, I want to quote from Benny Hinn. B Benny Hinn, who is perhaps one of the best-known prosperity gospel preachers, we don't hear so much of him these days as he's he's much older now and has lost a lot of the the fame and the um, significance and impact that he had in the past. But throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, um, he was one of the prominent teachers. And Benny Hinn in his book, um, Lord, I Need a, Mir a Miracle says, if you're looking for a book to help you rationalize and justify your infirmities, this volume is not for you. I'm not the one who prays, if it be your will, Lord, grant healing to this person. In his, one of his miracle crusades in the year 2002, he stated emphatically to everyone present, well over 20,000 people, it is God's will to heal you, period, for everyone there. Uh, in, in his TV show, and I'm not even sure if the TV show's on anymore, but in that regular TV show that he had for a number of years, he would often quote 3 John verse 2. And uh, this is the verse uh, that says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that um, 
that all uh, may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Normally, they would quote it in the King James Version, may um, you prosper and be, uh, be as healthy, uh, prosper in your health, even as your soul pros prospers. And Hin said, as we read 3rd John, these are his words, that it is God's highest desire for you. God's greatest desire for the church of Jesus Christ is that we be in total and perfect health. Now, all that verse is, is John writing to a friend and wishing him that he will have good health. That's all it is. It's just simply a greeting, like you and I would say, stay safe. I hope you're well. That's all that is. But he took that verse and he made this state, statement that it is the greatest desire of Jesus Christ that his church be in total and perfect health. Um, I don't know about you, but I think Jesus has a greater desire for the church than that. I think Jesus desires his church to walk with him in sincerity, in repentance, and truth, to be filled with the Spirit, to be proclaiming the gospel around the world. He wants his church to reflect his very image. In his book, Rise and Be Healed, he says this, he promises to heal all, everyone, any, any whatsoever, everything, all our diseases. That means not even a headache, sinus condition, not even a toothache, nothing. No sickness should come your way. God heals all your diseases. So healing theology like that only has one category for physical suffering, and that is that physical suffering is always bad. It's an obstacle that prevents you from living a full and a free Christian life. But the Bible never speaks about suffering in this way. In uh, Psalm 119, verse 67, David speaks of the benefits of affliction and suffering. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Of course, Paul in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, talks about his thorn in the flesh, and that that thorn in the flesh was God's means of, of keeping him dependent on God's grace. So if your theology of suffering is that there is no theology of suffering, then you will be bewildered and misguided and confused in your Christian walk. I can guarantee you that. The third thing is that Christians give in order to gain material compensation from God. And this really is, friends, a, um, a fixation in the prosperity gospel movement. They are fixated on giving uh, Robert Tilton, uh, one of the prosperity gospel teachers, says he calls this the law of compensation. And according to this law, which he says is based on Mark 10, 29 and 30, let me just read Mark 10, 29 and 30. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. And so this, this is one of their proof texts. The law of compensation, according to Tilton, is that Christians, using Mark 10, verses 29 and 30, Christians should, Christians should give generously to others, because when they do, God gives back more in return. And this, in turn, leads to a cycle of ever-increasing prosperity. Uh, Gloria Cop Copeland, um, the wife of Kenneth Cop Cop Copeland, wrote a book entitled God's Will is Prosperity, and she says this, give $10 and you will receive $1,000. Give $1,000 and receive $10,000. In short, Mark 10 is a very good deal, she says. Well, this doctrine really is based on or built on a faulty motive. And Jesus did teach us to give, but he taught us to give, according to Luke 6.35, hoping for nothing in return. But prosperity preachers teach their people to give because they will get a great return. And this really is one of the things that you often hear them saying. The fourth thing is that faith is a self-generated spiritual force. That leads to prosperity in the end. 
Now, we believe that the Bible teaches that faith is trust. It is trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the prosperity gospel teachers teach something very, very different. Uh, Copeland, again, in his book, The Laws of Prosperity, says faith is a spiritual force, a spiritual energy, a spiritual power. It is this force of faith which makes the laws of the spirit world function. There are certain laws governing prosperity revealed in God's word, and faith causes them to fun function. So again, this human-motivated, self-generated force that uh, leads to prosperity in the end. Uh, they don't talk about faith being a God-granted gift or a God-centered act of the will. Rather, it, it, if you listen carefully to what they're saying, it is a humanly produced spiritual force, and it's directed at God, which takes me to this final uh, doctrinal teaching, uh, and that is that prayer is a tool to force God to grant prosperity, a tool to force God. Uh, prayer is not humble pleading with God. It's not beseeching God. It's, it's forcing God. It's a tool that we use to get God uh, to do what we want him to do. And you'll often hear them quote James chapter 4, verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. And they will encourage us to pray for success in all areas of life. Uh, Creflo Dollar, who I already mentioned, is one of the well-known prosperity gospel preachers, writes, when we pray, believing that we already have received what we're praying, listen to this, God has no choice but to make our prayer come to pass. It is the key to getting results as a, Christ a Christian. Now, there's an element of truth in what he's saying, but there's an element of falsehood, too. God has no choice but to make our prayer come to pass because prayer is a tool to force God to do what we want him to do. Now, we know it's not wrong to pray for personal blessing. Jesus said we should pray for our daily bread. Uh, but there is an overemphasis on man, on human beings. Prayer is turned into a tool that believers can use to force God to grant their, their desires. And even though they quote James 4, verse 2, they hardly ever quote James 4, verse 3, which says, you do not you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions or desires. God does not answer selfish requests that do not honor his name. So let me close then by just sharing five things about how we can identify a prosperity gospel preacher. I've mentioned a few names there are many others. Some are more extreme in their emphasis on prosperity. Some are moderate. But what generally characterizes them, and how would you identify them uh, without me giving you the names? And um, the, the five things, or the six things I want to share with you now, they all come from John Piper in one of his books. And he says the first thing that marks or helps us identify a prosperity preacher is that the is the absence of a serious doctrine of the biblical necessity and normalcy of suffering the absence of a doctrine of suffering i already made reference to this if your theology of if your theology of suffering is that there is no theology of suffering then that is going to be very problematic for you in your christian walk so basically, if you're suffering, it's because you don't have faith. And if you exercise faith, faith is this strong spiritual force that should bring about healing and wealth for you. Second thing is, uh, you can identify a prosperity gospel preacher by an absence of a clear and prominent doctrine of self-denial. Um, self-denial is a clue that something is amiss in their teaching or the lack of mentioning self self-denial um jesus told us to take up the cross he, he told us to die to ourselves um he he talked about this the apostles speak of the same thing and you seldom if ever hear any reference to self-denial and that's a clue that something is wrong following jesus involves the cross it involves self-denial 
The third thing would be an absence of a serious exposition of what script, scripture says. And I think I've, I think this refers to the, the former two points I've just mentioned. It ties in with those, but friends, in some of the examples that I've given you tonight, and, and I think we'll hear more as we begin our conversation with Charles in just, in just a moment. You will, you will, if you listen, you will find that they're constantly proof texting. That is, they'll take a verse of the Bible and they'll use the verse to prove what they want to say. Uh, let me give you an example from Benny Hinn. He has written in, in, in his book uh, on about Ephesians 5, verse 23, which says that Jesus is the savior of the body. Now, Ephesians 5 is talking about the relationship between a husband and a wife, and Paul compares marriage to Christ's relationship to the church. And Paul does say in Ephesians 5, 23, that Jesus is the savior of the body. So Benny Hinn uses this verse to then say, if Jesus is the savior of your body, then your body ought to be made whole. Context is everything here. If you really expound Ephesians 5, if you expound the context in which Paul says Jesus is the savior of the body, you'll realize immediately he's not talking about your physical body, my physical body. He's talking about the body of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the savior of the church. And so you get all of this misinterpretation and proof texting because scripture is not seriously explained. And then there's the absence of dealing with tensions in God's, in God's word. Um, when you really teach God's word in its entirety, when you make the word of God fully known, you're always running into tensions. Do the scriptures speak of healing? Yes, but the scriptures also speak of suffering. And there's a tension there. Um, do this, do the, does God's words, words speak of the will of individuals to believe the gospel? Yes, but the word of God also speaks about God's sovereign electing grace. And so when you preach all of God's word, you preach all of these truths and you hold them in tension, um, but in their teaching, there is no tension. Um, so things like suffering, sickness, is reference ever made to Timothy, that, that Timothy was ill and needed wine for his stomach's sake, or, or Paul's thorn in the flesh, or, or the book of Job, the whole story of Job. Um, these these raise issues for us. And, and even in the series we've done during the, lock, the lockdown, um, we've talked about these tensions of the, the sufferings that believers go through um, in our walk with the Lord. Hebrews 11, I think, is uh, one of the passages that should be referred to. It's often referred to by prosperity teachers, and they'll say, by faith, by faith, by faith. But they leave out those parts which talk about, by faith, they were sawn asunder. Um, and so Paul, or the writer to the Hebrews, does talk about great things. They stopped the mouths of lions, Daniel. Miracles did happen because of faith, but suffering also occurred, and it was because of faith that these believers were unable to endure suffering. The fifth thing that Piper mentions, mentions is that church leaders in the prosperity gospel uh, have exorbitant life, lifestyles. We could say a lot on that, uh, but it's, it is it is true. It is true. Uh, exorbitant sal sal salaries and life and lifestyles. And number six, there is a prominence of self and a marginalization of the greatness of God. It's what you can do as you force faith on God, uh, more so than on, on God himself. So these are, um, I think, uh, some points that help us. And um, I took, I think, about 25 minutes on those points. And so I'm glad that Jamie and Charles have hung in here with me during that time. Uh, Charles, um, maybe you could just uh, help us a little bit in light of some of the things that I've said. I, I don't know if some of this resonated with you, uh, if it was applicable to some of the teaching that you've heard in the past. But just give us a little bit of background because you were involved in a prosperity gospel church for many, many years. So um, it would be interesting in hearing your experience, and, and we can interact on some of the things that I've just taught tonight. All right, sure. Thank you, Pastor John, for that 25-minute um, uh, 
exposition on prosperity gospel. Uh, just to touch on a few points, like the last six points you talked about on how can we identify. I want to talk about two of them because the, one of them, it's something you will laugh about and the other is something that could not be easily discovered if you are not studious with your Bible. Uh, the first one, the absence of serious doctrine of the biblical necessity and normalcy of suffering. You know, the prosperity gospel has rhymes. So you hear things like, if you are suffering, check your offerings. So if you bring out a lot of offerings, it takes away your sufferings. Those rhymes are very sweet to hear. They will tell you if things are tight for you, that you can find a way to get things done, check your tight. And they keep pushing you that 10% is the minimum. You and I know there is really nothing wrong with tithe in itself, but it's what people make tithe to become and do with the funds that come in through tithe that really pollutes tithe. And the second one I want to talk, talk about is the absence of serious exposition of scripture. If I hear my former pastor preach, I'll be thinking, oh, 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 this is out of this world. Where did he get it from? You know what? It's truly out of this world because it's not according to biblical pattern. When you hear five different pastors preach from a text in the Bible, they should all allude to the same interpretation Though they may have different application depending on time, scenario, culture, whatever. But the interpretation of the scripture has to be constant. But trust me, you're going to get an inter interpretation that is out of this world. It's truly out of this world because it has nothing to do with the scripture. And when you hear them and you begin to think that, how can this be? And if you are not very studious with your Bible, you would almost believe the lie because it's something new. And the minds of man is naturally inclining to something new. That's why we keep having new phones, new everything, new update of cars. So when you hear something new, you tend to want to explore it. But brethren, the scripture is cast in stone. So, those two I want to talk about, I, I really needed to mention it because they are things that you, you, you would hear, you'll be thinking, where did he get it from? Yes, it's strange. So don't take it because it's absolutely strange. So that's just on the, uh, how can we identify? Just want to touch on those two. Um, and you know, when you were talking about um, mentioning few names, uh, these are names that are common in the West. And those people are also, uh, they've had great influences on uh, Africa and most especially Nigeria. We, my country is like the bedrock of prosperity gospel. And one of the things that is fascinating is the biggest auditoriums in the world are built in Nigeria. So when you look at the landscape, you're gonna see churches, massive warehouses, massive structures put together as supposedly place of worship. But trust me, they are not place of worship of our Lord Jesus Christ because they undermine the death and the resurrection of Christ. They do not teach according to the pattern. You know, when you teach Pastor John at church, uh, most of the time, it has different application to me. Uh, last two weeks, when you were talking about Aaron fashioning a calf and saying, let's make a sacrifice to the Lord before the golden calf. That's exactly all we do in Africa, in Nigeria. So they will, be, they will tell you, come to this conference and you learn how to build big ministries in the name of the Lord. Come and learn how to do major projects, mega projects in the name of the Lord. So everything is branded in the name of the Lord. 
but before whose altar mama and that is the great danger of prosperity gospel mm -hmm. because it's according to like uh first corinthians 15 verse 2 that talked about if you don't believe what paul was writing if you don't believe this that i'm teaching you believed in vain so and that's exactly what is happening because everyone now gets disappointed but that disappointment doesn't come overnight it takes years at first i got angry at god myself now how could you allow me to spend years in these places but you know the same mercy of god that all believers enjoy till god is waiting until they repent is the same that the same grace that everybody enjoys and god just allows time for everything to come at the right time if god had knocked you out at uh, the very moment you got into it you might not fully appreciate it but when you've been through it, the wilderness and you eventually come to the promised land then you know that oh what a world of difference yeah. charles can can you just share with us um what what was it that opened your eyes to this? How, how many years were you in this? And I mean, you 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 were very enthusiastic and very involved in a in a prosperity gospel church. It was your spiritual home in a sense. So, what what was it that that started your thinking to shift? Okay, I was there for ten years, and one of the what I will call it. At first, I called it faith failure. But now when I look back, it's the sovereignty of God that brought me out. Because you couldn't tell me otherwise. You couldn't even speak ill of my pastor. I would, I would, I would almost get into a fist fight with you. Uh, and you couldn't speak ill of the message because I believed it. But you know, thank God that I have passion for things. I don't like uh, doing things halfway or something a uh, little year, little day. I always want to concentrate all my energy and get it done. So as the time passed by, the prosperity message will almost make you forget about your diligence that you are working hard, but will make you believe that someone carries a grace that is working for you. Would almost believe that you've gone to school and you're educated and makes you believe that, no, if you were in a church, you would not achieve the same result as you were in this church because I have something that is a multiplier of your effort. So when time goes by and I began to progress in life in many things, so I attempted to do a project and it was to cost me a lot of money. So I put in a lot into it, a lot, a, a whole lot. Things we've worked for for years, we put it into it. And every stage, because what I've realized, if you do something and it fail, they'll say, you didn't pray enough or you didn't fast enough. Uh, oh, there's a seed you are supposed to sow. Okay, you sowed that seed, there's another seed of turnaround that needs to come over. So there's always one more thing to do. It never ends. But trust me, Pastor John, I went through all the lines. I dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. So when I got to the point and it failed, the first thing I did was to sit down. Does God really exist? But in my heart, I was convinced that God existed. So the next suspect for me was the message I was hearing. So I sat down, with, I resigned. Uh, in the press of the, of the project, I resigned from uh, working as an IT consultant. So I was spending more time at home. So I sat down with the scripture and began to read in context. I know a lot of scriptures we pick here and there, you join half of A to uh, part B of another verse and make it into one and make it look sweet. So when I began to read, 
going back through my, I have my notes for 10 years. I still have it at home. So I began to go through all the Bible verses just to see what was I missing. Are so you, when I read, are you are you referring to the notes that you took by I, I took a church, to, yes. their, to their preaching? Okay. Yes. So th there is no ambiguity of maybe you left it. I still have my notes. So when I went through the notes, then I began to realize I began to read the scripture now in context. Then I began to realize that this doesn't match the notes. The context of the scripture is in misalignment with what was taught. So then I realized that. So I continued going to church, but uh, each time I'm in service, I stopped taking notes because I knew something is not true. Then I was more alert to observe. Then when I hear a scripture, I open it, I read in context, not minding any other thing that's been said, and I realized that all these are fads and they were never true. And I said to my wife, let's find another church. And we, and we moved through three churches, uh, not moved, we attended each Sunday, one Sunday for each, we identified three. And on the second one, we came to West Island and said, nope. And you were in Exodus, Exodus chapter three. Okay. So when I came and I heard gospel according to Exodus, I said, what was this? But when I had the message, I left in tears. Hmm. I said, oh. But you know what's funny? Is that prosperity gospel teachers will make you to eight theologians, will make you to eight Bible exposition because they don't do it. And they can't teach a book of the Bible. They just have to keep giving you topics. Seven ways to financial breakthrough. Oh, let me give you an example. I think I have a note handy here. Uh, just for you to see sample of topics and uh, what it looks like. So that you don't think I'm just bringing all this from, uh, uh, from my head. This is also my office, so I have lots of all my notes. I keep records and I'll give you dates. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so when I went through this process and I realized that, oh, all these are not true, then I began to tell my wife that we're in trouble. That the trouble we have is that all we've heard, all we've learned about God is not the truth about God. All we've been told is just a lie. Something to, to, to make us the God of our life. It's always about you, 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 you will get it. You will receive it. You cannot fail. You will achieve it. It's, so I was made the God of my life. I was the God. And now using Yahweh to meet my own needs. Hmm. So that's the syncretism you were talking about two weeks ago. Right. So when I saw all this, uh, it, at that point, I said, we just have to get out of here. And that was how we got out. And we never looked back. Mm. So let me give you an example. Uh, this is leaders meeting. Because I was also uh, in the pastorate of the church. After many years of serving in the junior church, I became uh, a minister. So, but all this process, all these procedures makes you get, entangles you so much that you don't think of anything else other than the church and serving the purpose of the man, not of God. And that is the biggest danger in prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. So in this leadership meeting, we learned about fundamentals of position. Is that what you should be learning about fundamentals of a position, being a leader? I remember when Pastor Chris uh, came to minister before he resumed to us, or maybe his first sermon, and he was talking about being faithful messenger. 
the same thing uh, Pastor Jamie here did when he came and he talked to Timothy, uh, being faithful to the message, getting the message. Uh, he was taught the Holy Scripture from early childhood, became a Christian, and then he has to be in the discipleship making. Leaders are supposed to be taught how to serve the people, but we were taught how people to serve us. There's a way you have to carry yourself as a leader. There's a, there are things you have to do as a leader. So we talked about, then, why am I called to serve? Um, uh, what is leadership? So you find business principles, uh, things in the academic world, but they just find relevant scriptures to proof text it and present it to you. In fact, the biggest shock of my life was when I watched the uh, something on Netflix that talks about uh, being enlightened. I've forgotten the title now. When I saw that series of people that has nothing to do with the Church of Christ, I could see the messages that I was hearing for years. And I was thinking, someone just branded something in the, you know, it's like taking something from McDonald's or, or taking a McDonald's Happy Meal box and put garbage in it and give it to kids and say, happy meal for you. See the box, they are excited because it's McDonald's that they know. So we're excited that this is church because we want to love God. But the content is very bad. And you see, a drop of poison in a full glass of water makes it a poisonous water. And some of the times you might find out that these preachers are saying the right things. Even you find a dead wristwatch will be at least correct two times a day. If your watch died 7 a.m. in the morning, by the evening, you see, if you look at it, even you know, five minutes to seven, you will excuse your watch that maybe it's just delayed. And following morning again, if you look at it, but most of the time, they are wrong. Do you have any follow-up questions? I'm sure we do. Uh, Jamie, uh, perhaps you have a question for uh, Charles. Yeah, Charles, I'm wondering, like, so for someone that's in the prosperity church, if they go through some financial hardship or some health concerns and they come to the pastor, um, is the answer always either you're not giving enough or you're, you've got some sin in your life? Like, is that what they would hear? Absolutely. Well, let me tell you how you could hear. There are sins in your life. You are not serving. You first ask him, what department are you? Go and enroll in the department. Join the workforce. So you start serving. Then they'll tell you, how about your giving? Are you faithful in your titan? Because God's promise is for you not to be sick. But you see, when I critically look right now, there is sickness all around us. But you know what? People hide their pains because they don't want to be seen as weak in faith. And that's why in prosperity gospel churches, they don't announce when people die. They just, people just die. You don't, can't bury, do any service in church. You have to go find somewhere else to bury your people because we don't accommodate that here because it's the church of the living God. The only thing that we see is goodness. And when they put you through these cycles, it puts the blame back on you because you will always find one thing you are not doing right. And even if you were the one that is doing everything right, they will ask you, how about your wife? Is she doing this? Is she doing that? Then you would find an excuse. You will now begin to make excuse for them because they've put you in a box. Hmm. Would you, um, this could go to Charles or John, um, often reading through the book of Job, that's a great book on suffering right Job went through so much and then you got these three guys that come up to him and are offering lot, lots of platitudes and I've often thought they're kind of like do I, I almost see similarities between some of their responses to Job and prosperity teachers would you see a connection there oh absolutely great connection because they would tell one of the friends I can't remember his name talked about I had a dream last night saying something to Job what he saw but he had no dream. <laughs> Even if he had a dream, it's not from God. 
So the, it was his dominant thought playing out in his dreams. And this is why in prosperity gospel churches, sometimes you find uh, a sermon is prepared, but you say, no, I'm preaching something else. How can you just preach out of your head? And you find people preaching and just ranting, just going up and down. In fact, let me make you laugh a little bit. Uh, because this will, this will really get you to laugh. Um, let me first give you a definition of faith. Faith is obeying God to prove that you believe God. We well, you know the topic of the sermon? Living above average. Uh, next sermon is talking about uh, God's purpose for you is health. Uh, let me give you another one. Financial loss. That is a sermon. <laughs> um, how to receive divine healing and stay individually healthy. Living in the overflow. Um, I looked through years. I couldn't find anything that realigns me to God. You know, 2 Timothy 3.16 is talking about all scripture is given by inspiration. They are useful to teach us what is true and to us to make corrections in our lives. But no, they keep setting the bar for you. And you keep aiming for this bar, next bar. When you achieve it, they tell you, go for more. Uh, don't stop where you are. You can get more. And you know the purpose. It's like someone raising a chicken farm. And you keep feeding the chickens, not because you so much love them. It's just because you want bigger eggs, bigger chicken meat. That's exactly. So they want to push you to the point where you go and get so much. They sell you greed. And by the time you go get it, because you've been programmed already that the more you bring back, the more also God multiplies back to you. So the moment you bought into the greed is an unending cycle mm. and you don't find peace. One of the things I told a sister friend, I said, the first time you leave a prosperity gospel church, one thing that will first happen to you is like, you will think you have no problems in life. She said, why? Because they are the ones merchandising problems to you. Yeah, I have uh, yeah one more question here. Um, <clears throat> if you drive around Hamilton or other places, you wouldn't necessarily identify this is a prosperity church or this is a prosperity church. Um, yet, if you go on the Amazon bestsellers for Christian books, you're going to find Joel Austin. You're going to find. So it seems like even people who are going to good churches are affected by the prosperity gospel. And so I'm just wondering, like, what are how do you think we, even if we go to good churches, why is it, why do we still buy into it even subtly, even if we don't go to a prosperity church where we're still wanting to hear these truths, we're still wanting to buy these books? Well, the simple answer is in the heart. Um, every man uh, loves being put on the pedestal. And that's what these people are good at your best life now. You know, every one of us still uh, hope to earn just a little much more money so we can buy a little more comfort. But when you get it, you raise the bar again. So naturally, the heart of man is looking to acquire what the true message of Christ is to bring about contentment. Oh, thank God for your message on wrong keeping and wrong taking, mm. Pastor Jimmy. It was because when you look, well, one of the key things you said that when you are earning forty thousand dollars in Canada, you are wealthy. That was mind blowing. Mm. But you know what? If you are in a prosperity gospel church, if you are not earning six figures, you are nowhere to be found. So it's because the heart naturally is looking for that skin. extra bites. And someone here comes with, I can make you get it. So 
if you are not very in tuned and studious yourself, you would buy into it. Mm. And that's why the books are still bestsellers. Charles, um, I heard a pastor uh, recently, and perhaps we'll kind of wrap up with this que question, but I heard a pastor recently say that uh, COVID, the arrival of COVID and what COVID has done, um, has actually is actually having, in the United States at least, um, a very bad effect on the prosperity gospel preachers there, because they have talked so much about healing, they've talked so much about God's power, and um, and yet, you know, people have not seen the kind of miraculous healing. I years ago, you you mentioned things that are funny, but year, years ago, uh, when the SARS crisis first happened, I was pastoring in Toronto, and SARS was the predecessor of of COVID. And I was pastoring in Toronto at the time, and I could actually look out the window of my office at the hospital that was the hot spot. Of, uh, of SARS in the Toronto. And um, Richard Roberts, the son of Oral Roberts, who is a faith healer, uh, he canceled his crusade in Toronto during SARS. And he said the reason for the cancellation of the crusade is because of SARS. And I can remember thinking to myself, well, if you really had the gift of healing, um, if you really have the power of God, I can't imagine Jesus saying, I won't go into that city and heal people there because there's lepers there. You know, it, it didn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, so I, I wondered um, any predictions about, um, now I know your context has been in Nigeria, but any context, it, it, would you say that's a true state, statement that, that COVID is, is having an adverse effect on prosperity gospel preaching? Uh, it, it is. And when I talk about Nigeria, Nigerians, Nigerian churches are everywhere in the Western world. Right. So it's, it's a big thing here in Canada too. Mm -hmm. Even some of the largest churches in the GTA are Nigerian churches. So when you talk about COVID, both for uh, Nigerian churches here and the ones back home, it had effects to some extent. And the extent of its effect was that people saw that mm, our pastors aren't as anointed as they proclaim themselves to be. Mm. But, you know, the voice of these pastors, because they have access to unlimited resources, is very loud. So they go through, they use all media to still find a way to say things to make people say the largest church in Nigeria that has branches in almost 200 countries of the world. Mm -hmm. When they ask the general overseer that why are people coming in millions to you every month? He said, if they're not getting their miracles, they wouldn't be coming. That's the only reason. But unfortunately, this man that had been spotless uh two weeks ago one of his son which is also a pastor died suddenly four days before his death he went to another church celebrating 40 years in ministry for that church and he gave them a mantle that this mantle which is an anchor chief someone has raised three dead with it already so take this anything that is dead is going to arise four days after his son died and people ask the question, if what you said for this was true about the handkerchief, why can't a thousand of your members go and raise your son with the same handkerchief? It is true. God is sovereign. And if we don't come to that conclusion and we don't uh, settle ourselves down at the feet of Jesus to learn, we would be in this situation where we are settled in our faith. Well, thank you, Charles. I think your personal uh, perspective and experience on all this has been very, very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to God for you, and I praise the Lord that he brought you out of this and has really given you a full understanding of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, Jamie, uh, thank you for hosting this event uh, tonight. Um, we're grateful for this whole Trek semester online. I know we bring Trek to an end tonight and uh, in the fall, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen, but uh, we know that you're working on some plans for the fall. So we'll continue to trust you and trust the Lord in the development of, a, of an ongoing Trek, Trek plan. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, your presence is appreciated very much. We hope that you have found this helpful, uh, stimulating to your thinking, um, perhaps uh, eye-opening um, because as we've already pointed out, many of these teachers, uh, their books are available in most Christian bookstores and they're bestsellers among Christian people. And there's always an element of truth in there, but I hope that this has given you some discernment uh, to help you uh, discern uh, what is true and what actually isn't. Uh, we want to uphold the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to make the word of God fully known so that we will prosper in the right way that God wants us to. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. May God bless you. Thank you.